I'd like to introduce you to React.js. React.js is a JavaScript framework that you're going to use in the browser to help you to display the view of your application in, your tut in the tutorial and in your assignment and to keep the HTML that's showing in the browser um, updated as the data that you need to display changes. Um, to introduce this, I'd like to start from a bit of a historical perspective. So AJAX, Asynchronous JavaScript and, and XML, it originally stood for, is this style of application that um, started to become popular in the early 2000s. And JavaScript in the browser makes background requests down to the server to get some data, retrieves the data, and then modifies the document object model, modifies the, uh, the, 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 the tree structure that the, that the browser is showing in the web page. And to begin with, this tended to use lots of hand-spun code that called into the document object model API. And very often it would use a little library called jQuery. So for example, if we go to the, um, the, the, the tutorial from uh, week seven that was kind of making calls down to the server to get some gibberish, and let's just reload that and let's go get some gibberish. And so it makes a call and this is returning some JSON data that is, it is then inserting into this text area. And it's doing this uh, pretty much manually. So if we go over to the code, uh, in window.getgibberish, um, it first of all says, well, I want to get the address of the server. And so it says, and this is, this is using the jQuery library. It says, in the document, get the element that has the ID I underscore server. So in index.html, uh, if we go in here, here it is. Input, type is text, ID is I underscore server. Okay, so get that element and get the value out of it and put this in this variable. Get this element that's got this ID and put its value into, the, into this variable. And then it, it goes and it makes its request down to the server, parses the data that comes back, and then it says go and get the element that's got this ID gibber, uh, or gibber, and that is this one here, text area ID is gibber, and then set the value of it to be the, the, the string that we've constructed up here um, in, this, in, this, uh, in this copy script for loop. But that's all a little bit tangly. We've got IDs on the elements in the HTML that have to correspond exactly to the IDs that I'm uh, selecting on in my jQuery. And if you can imagine, as my application grows, as it gets more functionality, um, I'm going to have this problem that I'm going to be trying to maintain manually all these IDs between different things or class names or which, whichever kinds of selectors that we're using and all of this manual code to go and update the state of the document object model tree. And so this could get quite, quite messy and unmaintainable, which was a bit of a problem. Another problem that comes up is the browser it's got a document model. It's not really got a widget model. So HTML has these low-level tags like um, paragraphs and divs and headings and unordered lists and ordered lists and list items. But it doesn't really have a tag for, I want to put a user profile widget here. And I want to bind it to say, and I want to be showing it for the user that's in the JavaScript variable, my user. And it doesn't have anything to say, well, I want to put my calendar here. I want it open to the year 2015. I want it to be doing its month view for the month of August and displaying all of the data that's, that's in the JavaScript about the events that are in your calendar. Um, so manipulating lots of these low level elements, it kind of makes for fairly unreadable, messy code. And so most modern front-end frameworks, they introduce a, co a component model. If you like, how can we teach HTML to have a component like this? So we can just say, I want a calendar here, and I want to define my calendar over there and, and then be able to reuse it uh, the way that we reuse widgets in other UI toolkits. There's quite a few single page app frameworks around there that will help you to do this. Angular.js, Knockout, Ember.js, lots and lots more of them. And they're, 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 uh, they're, they're fairly popular. 
one of the things that many of them do is um, they have this idea that you'll keep your application state that you want to render in some JavaScript data. That, that, that's your model. And then they have this idea of binding the data to UI elements on the page. So here we said user profile widget user. User is my user. So trying to bind this user profile and what it shows to the my user object. Uh, so that as the my user object changes, the user profile widget on the screen would also change. Um, many of these frameworks do two directional bindings. Um, so this is the idea that well, if the data in the model updates, perhaps because we've got some new information that's come from the server, we've been told to change something, then we need to update the view. But if the view's got controls on it, then it's quite possible that the controls also need to update the data. So for instance, if you've got your calendar view, but you've also got a list of upcoming events, then if I create a new item in the calendar, well, it needs to turn up in the new list of upcoming events as well. And as I type into it, it um, the data need, needs, to, needs to go through. And so there was binding in two directions so that the controls that the user has can also feed back into the model. Um, so this means that you can have this situation where, okay, if some data updates, we need to update the element on the page. But in the other direction, if the user is using the controls, we need to update the data. But the user using the control updating the data could mean that some other element needs updating as well. And those might even have some triggers on them that change some more data and mean that some other things need updating too. And so the picture you should be getting here is that um, in these occasions, you can get some quite interesting quirky flows uh, of behavior through the um, through through the UI framework as different things updating bits of data trigger other things needed to update bits of data and it can be a little bit difficult sometimes to to hold in your head everything that's going on there and so the the, the people at React that produce React felt that two directional data binding is also a bit messy. Well, first of all, you have to write your code to display the widget and then you have to write code that knows how to react to changes in the data it's displaying and knows how to update itself um, to update the widget. And you can get these bind storms where a change in one place triggers a change in somewhere else, triggers a change somewhere else, etc. And um, these could sometimes be a little bit slow, but actually it's this main one, this one at the bottom is the main one they were interested in. They were interested in can you as a programmer fairly straightforwardly have a picture of what the, the flow of changes is, what's happening in, in my app, uh, the logic of updating. An analogy that's quite useful for explaining how React.js works. Um, let's imagine it was 1994 again and we didn't have these Ajax frameworks. Ordinary gets and posts, when someone fills in a form, they click submit, and it goes down to the server. The server doesn't try and work out how to modify any HTML. The server just sends you, here's a new page full of HTML. And so from a developer's perspective, that was really quite simple. We don't need to write the code to update the HTML at all. We just need to write code to produce HTML, an HTML view based on the data that we've got. From, inter from an interaction perspective, it's a bit annoying because every time you do something, you've got to do a round trip to the server and you get a, a page refresh and you lose uh, lots of transient state. So, you know, your, your scroll position or your play position in a video or where, where, where you were in a, um, in a text box or something like this. Um, but from a developer's perspective, it meant the model of where does this HTML come from? How is it being updated? Uh, it was generally pretty simple. What if we could make the JavaScript side of it just as simple as that? And so this is what React.js tries to do. And they describe it as being the V in MVC. Uh, so in the model view controller, they're just trying to be the view. They don't want to define what, what, what you use for your model. That's entirely up to you. Um, they don't want to define your controllers, how, how you make changes to things. They just want to help you deal with the problem of you've got some data and you want to render it as HTML in the browser. And so in React.js, the components you write, they know how to produce HTML, but they don't know how to update it. Um, 
so they, they only deal with, okay, I've got this data, I want to render that, here's, here's the HTML that represents that, or at least here's the document tree that re represents that. Your components, uh, they can keep some local JavaScript state that can be modified if they want. So for instance, if you've got a form element and it's got an input text field, then as the user is typing in the text field, this is sending on change events that are changing your local state for that text field in terms of what data is there. So there's a, it's a little bit of local state. It's not been applied in your model. They haven't clicked save yet, um, but uh, but it, it, the, the, the component just needs to remember, okay, here's what they've been typing so far, so that when it produces HTML from its state, it produces HTML that has the, um, the, the, the users typing in it. And in the React.js model, you don't worry about working out which bits of the page you need to update. Every time anything changes, your code just has to produce, here's fresh HTML for the whole page. Um, so it's a very, very simple model there. Now, of course, this has the slight problem that if you actually re-rendered the whole page, you'd lose all that transient ephemeral state. You'd lose the scroll position, you'd lose cursor position in input fields, of how far you were through the video, etc. And that would be really, really annoying. Um, so we don't want that to happen. We just want the programming model to be that simple. So React's solution to this is that your components don't really render to the browser's document object model. Your components never update the real page. Instead, they create elements in a virtual John. Uh, and these are these are just JavaScript objects. They're not actually being displayed in the browser when, you're, when your uh, components create them. And so that means they're very, very fast to produce. The DOM is quite slow, the document object model. If I make a manipulation to something that's shown in the browser, then the browser needs to redo its layout because maybe maybe that's going to overflow a line and every all the sizes of everything needs to be recalculated and then it needs to be painted. And all of that layout and painting takes some time. So the, the, the DOM, what's live in your browser, is slow. But these aren't what's being displayed in your browser. These are just JavaScript objects being made in a data structure. And that's really fast. You can make thousands of those ever so, ever so quickly. And so you're on each update, your application can just produce a new virtual document object model for the whole page. And to react, what you've done is you've produced, this is the target state that I would like the browser to be in. I've just described, this is what I want to be showing in the browser. And then react.js will internally, it will look at that and it'll look at what's actually being displayed in the browser. And it goes through and it does a diff. And it works out, OK, what are the changes I need to make to make the browser look like what you rendered in the virtual DOM? So it does that diff, works out a small set of changes that it needs to make. So the upshot of this is that your code never has to worry about how to update HTML. It just has to produce HTML. It can be declarative. Given the state that I've got, this is the HTML that I output. But the HTML of the page does end up getting updated to match what you want. React.js handles this for you, so all the transient straights, the scroll position, etc., is preserved, and everything ends up being acceptably fast, 60 frames per second, even on poor browsers, iPad browsers, etc. Okay, so how to get started with it? Well, React.js, it's a JavaScript framework, so initially we just need to include the framework, its source code, in our page. Script sources, um, uh, and th th this is uh, on, this is Facebook hosting, hosting the script for you. So you can just stick that script element in your page and you've got, um, you've got uh, react.js. Let's do an example. Suppose our model is incredibly trivial. We have one JavaScript variable called the name and it's set to Algernon. And we're going to create a React component that's going to say hello to someone. And so what we've said is react.create class. This is how we declare React components, is react.create class. And uh, we've given it a display name so that we can use this in tags. You'll see that in a bit. And um, because it's a React component, it has to have a render function. And this render function says, 
this is the HTML that I want to produce. Anytime I'm asked to render myself, produce this HTML. But you can see from this that this, is a, this isn't really producing HTML. This is calling react.createElement, creating a, an element in this virtual DOM, uh, basically coming up with this, this, this structure behind the scenes to say what we want our HTML to look like. And in this case, it says, I want to create a div. I don't want to give it any particular uh, attributes. And I want it to contain the string hello. And I also want it to contain this dot props dot name. Props is the properties that are passed into this component. And from that properties object, I want to get the name field. And so now if I wanted to render something, let's render it. I could say react dot render of create element. And I've passed in directly the, the reference to hello message that, were, that was passed back. And here's the properties. That's the properties object being passed in. And the name field is set to the name variable, which if we go back and look in the model was Algernon. And so sure enough, this should render div hello Algernon. Let's find out if it does. Um, React, uh, Facebook, they, they very kindly created a an integration for JS Fiddle. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll use that for a moment for, um, for rendering it. And uh, you'll notice in here, so in here I've said mount node. Mount node is a variable. Uh, so the first thing to say is where, where do we want to render this? Well, I'm going to say that mount node is this variable, I want to set it to be document dot get element by ID of container. So up here we've got this div with an ID of container. That's where I'm going to get it to do its rendering. And so now let's go back across here and let's copy our code across. There's our model. Let's copy that in. There's our component declaration. Let's copy that in. And there is our call to us to render it on the mount node. And let's copy that in. And let's press run. And hello, Algernon. It works. So th 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 this is a, a trivially small example. Um, Let's now show this actually in. Um, let, let's let's show this in our example from before. So over here, um, actually, let, let's not. I'll, I'll come back to that later on. Sorry, I was about to change my running order, but I won't. I won't. I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. Okay. There's a sort of a bit of a problem with that. So this code here, sure enough, it's doing it. But if we look at our render method in this uh, in this React.js component, that looks a bit ugly. I don't know about you, but that's not really how I tend to write HTML. And trying to write a whole complicated um, structure of a widget uh, with its with the HTML that it might need uh, using that particular format would be awkward. Uh, it would be a little bit of a pain. Um, so to solve this problem, uh, the people at Facebook, they've also provided a their own little language called JSX. And so this is their own syntax that lets you write render methods that look like HTML. So this is the same thing in uh, in JSX. So here we've got the, the var, the name is Algernon again. Um, but here now our, um, our React component declaration looks a little bit different. We've said react.create class, but in the render method, we've suddenly got something that looks like HTML. It's really going to compile to doing that, but it looks like HTML. And in here, we've even got hello space, and we've inserted using curly braces, and I want to put this dot props dot name in there, uh, which is the equivalent of this uh, hello comma this dot props dot name in the function call. And again on the render uh, on the render method, and here we've got the notation where uh, this dot props we're setting this dot props dot name by saying name equals curly braces the name. 
Okay, so if that's JSX, how do we get that into the browser? Well, here's one way. Facebook has provided a JSX transformer in JavaScript, and so you can include that in your page just by including another, another script tag. And then, if you give your script the appropriate type, so it's no longer text JavaScript, it's now text JSX, the transformer will pick up your script and it will do the translation for you and your code will work. And roughly speaking, that's what uh, happens in the fiddle, in the JS fiddle. So if I go back here and I now take that code and I post it into my JS fiddle and I run it, it produces the same result. Okay, that's all well and good, but there's a problem. <clears throat> It means that we can't minify our JSX because, well, the minifier, uglify JS, it doesn't understand JSX. It only understands how to minify JavaScript. Um, so if we want to use it in production, we're probably going to need to do our compilation from JSX to JavaScript on the server. And we're using Play Framework that has all these SBT plugins. And sure enough, there is one for integrating um, a JSX compiler. Um, <clears throat> in this case, uh, add SBT plugin, it's off GitHub and it's called SBT React JS and that's the version of it. And so if we put that into, again, project plugins, not conf plugins, um, I really must learn not to copy and paste that uh, that typo into, into my next set of slides. Um, the if, if we add that into project plugins.sbt, uh, then just as the CoffeeScript compiler would spot .coffee files and turn them into JS files, this will spot .jsx files and turn them into JS files within our app assets JavaScript directory. And so let's do this. So here in plugins.sbt, let's go and put that plugin in there. And I'll need to go back to SBT. And because I've changed the plugins, I'm going to need to do a reload. I'll just leave that loading and come back here. And let's we've got this file gibberish.jsx. And in this case, I've said mount node is going to be document.get element by ID of render me. So in index.html, I'm going to want uh, an element with the ID render me and let, let's just clear out this uh, this other example for the moment and say ID equals render me and let's save that and I'm going to want to include gibberish.jsx uh, well gibberish.js it will compile to and I need to include uh, the react framework itself as well um, now, the first way I'm doing this, I'm going to hit a bug um, in my code deliberately to show you something from an earlier video. Uh, so let's copy that script tag and let's paste this in. So that's going to include react.js. And now let's go in here and let's do the bit that I paused on before than I was thinking of doing earlier. Uh, where I go and put in my I go and put in my code and I try it out from play. So let's take this code and let's put this into my JSX and let's save it. And back here, okay, we've reloaded, so we'll now tell that to run. And in just a moment, we will reload this in the browser and we should see an error. So. Let's pop the console up, ready for our error, and let's hit refresh. And over here, it's compiling, uh, well, it's recompiling uh, a Scala source because I, 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 essentially because I did that reload, it's recompiling the less. And okay, application started, and here we go. So first of all, we've got an error, but it's not telling me what the error is. It says minified exception occurred, use the non-minified dev environment. All right, let's pop back to our index.html 
and instead of including the minified one, let's include the development version, the non-minified one, because in this case it also produces nicer error messages. And now we'll see what the error actually is. And it says, target container is not a DOM element. Why is that happening? What's going on? Well, let's go and see what gibberish.jsx is saying. It says, mount node is document.getElement by ad a render me. And then it wants to say, re render this on that mount node, on the element by ID render me. But if we look in index.html, here is our inclusion of the script. And if you remember, the browser parses the HTML and it hits the script and it wants to run it straight away. So it gets to this point and it wants to run it and it wants to find the element with the ID render me and it wants to get React to render into it. Um, but that's not going to work because the element with the ID render me is further down the page. It's not being reached yet. It doesn't exist in the page yet because we've been running it when we've only got this far through the parsing. So let's fix that up by using that defer attribute to say run this after you've loaded the page. And now it works. Um, now, just as the um, just as the CoffeeScript compiler, uh, you could see what the uh, JavaScript it produced was. You can do this as well with the uh, the JSX compiler. So that was the JSX we were looking at. But if we go down into target web and in this case into React.js, there it is, gibberish.js. This it was what it translates to. And I think if you have a look at that code there. And you have a look at the original version of the code back here. Well, let's just look for the um, the component declaration, and let's just paste this in, in at the bottom to compare the two. You should see that those lines there are identical. But I don't want to save that. This is a generated file, and I don't want to edit generated files. Um, <clears throat> but so we 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 can see. This is what the JSX uh, translates to in the browser. And in this particular case, you'll see that it doesn't have a source map at the bottom. <clears throat> OK, moving on. Practically speaking, when using uh, React.js, uh, I recommend starting off by identifying what your components are going to be. So in our trivial example that we're going to use in the tutorial, which is the gibberish list, where we're requesting a bunch of JavaScript data from the server, and we're wanting to show this on the page, uh, well, we might want to have a component that knows how to render a piece of gibberish. And then because we're wanting to show a list, we might want to have a component that knows how to show a list of those components that know how to list, uh, to show gibberish elements. Uh, so this is kind of how the components uh, um, nest. Uh, so start off by trying to identify the different kinds of components that you're going to need. Um, just to recap on a, the difference between props and state, because these come up. Um, props properties is a JavaScript object that containing the properties that get passed into the component. So here we're invoking the hello message component and we're passing it a properties object with name is set to um, the value of, of the name variable. State, however, is for transient stuff. So for instance, if the user is editing text in a form field and the component needs to remember it because when it re-renders that form field, it needs to keep the text in there. Uh, so let's imagine a to-do list as a very simple example. Suppose we have uh, our model, again, very, very simple. We just have a JavaScript variable that has an array of strings. And we might then want a component that knows how to render one to-do item. And that doesn't require any state. That only requires properties. We, we, we might just want it to be past the item. And so here's our to-do item. And its render method returns, in this case, a, a UL containing the item text. 
we might want a component that can show a list of those items. And again, just to do that, we don't need any state yet. We only need props. And so in this case, we've got to do list is react.createClass. And in this case, the render method, we've been given a, an array of these things. And so instead, what we've done is we, we, we've called, um, as our way of producing a list, we've called map with a function. And that function each time returns a to do item uh, with, the, with the current item out of the map. Um, so if you like, if we invoke this, we get a to do list item, and that to do list item has an array in its props, and its render uh, calls for, for each item in the prop. Well, I want a to do item with the item is, is that item from the array, and then the to do item uh, component its render method produces the, 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 the UL. And so that's kind of how, how the components nest there. But now maybe we want a widget that actually adds some items uh, to the list. And so in this case, we're going to need to keep a little bit of local state because there's going to be a text field that you're typing into to say what the item's going to be. So in this case, we've got a few more methods turning up in our uh, React component. So we say react.createGlass and let's just jump down to, to uh, well, let's start off with get initial state. Um, so if this is going to have some state, it needs to have some state to start with. And so get initial state is a method to declare, well, what should the, the starting state for this be? And we've decided it's just going to be a JavaScript object with a field called text, and that'll start empty. Let's jump down to the render method. Whoops. Uh, there we go. Uh, let's jump down to the render method. So we've got a div and we've got a heading and we've got the to-do list uh, items uh, for um, th uh, that is coming in this case from straight from our model variable. And then we've got a form. And in this form, we've now got we've got an on submit event and we've wired this up to this dot handle submit. And this dot handle submit, it's a function that we've declared just up here inside our react.create class, inside the, the, the JavaScript object we passed to that. Uh, apologies, I don't know why the page keeps jumping. Um, this receives the event, and the first thing we've said is don't do whatever the default was. Um, but what we've said is that when you submit the form, um, items, the model variable that's outside of React, is going to become whatever it was concatenated with an array containing our current state, so the, the, the text that you had typed in the text box. And then because this is not updating the state of any React components, React isn't going to automatically know, oh, I need to re-render this, uh, because that's just a JavaScript variable that's not going to itself trigger um, React to re-render. So in this case, I've done a this.force update just to say React Time to re-render things, re-render the whole page, please. If we go back down into the form, um, there's then an input field. And this one again has a, in this case, it has an on change event wired up to the this.onChange method. And again, we've declared the on change method just up here and it takes an event. And in this case, we've said it does this.setState and this.setState of e.target.value. It's going to uh, the event target, which is that input, uh, and and that the value from that input. So whenever you type into this box, if I hit a letter, uh, it's going to call this. It's going to call on on change, which is going to call this dot set state, and uh, it's going to get the value that's got that letter in it now because you just typed it in the text box, and it's going to set that in the state. And in this case, it is updating the state of a React component. And so that is automatically going to trigger a re-render. And so when it does the re-render, what's the HTML it's going to produce? Well, in the input, it says to make the value this.state.text. Uh, and fortunately, we'd just put the character into that state uh, up above. And so that, that will, that will, that, and so that will keep the character. So that's kind of the kind of the little loop it goes through. You hit a character in the box, updating the value. The value then calls on change on the component, updating the local state. That then triggers a re-render that actually re-renders the box, but with the same value in the virtual DOM. 
And then when Java, uh, when React.js does its diff, it sees it's the same and doesn't actually update, need to update that particular element anyway. Um, let's now put this into our, um, let's put all this code together and show it working in Play Framework. So let's clear that one out. And so items is foo. We want to have declare our to do item component. We want to declare our to do list component. And we want to declare our to do app. And that just runs off the bottom, doesn't it? So I'm just going to duck to the source version of my file there, copy the text out, and paste that into my code and save it and oh, there's a deliberate mistake here which we will see in a moment let's now go to my browser and hit refresh and initially i don't think i'm going to get anything oops oh that's silly of me i've i've put that into the wrong file already haha -ha, that's another silly mistake I need to edit the gibberish.jsx not the generated file because the generated file would get immediately overwritten anyway um, so let's save that and now let's do a refresh and so I didn't get anything why didn't I get anything well in this case because I forgot to put that render method back in react.render of and in this case we want to re render a to do app and we want to render it on mount node. All right, let's save that and hit refresh. And here's my little to do, and it's got foo in the list. And I could add a bar, and I could add a baz if I wanted, etc. So, so this is, and here it is. That that's the thing where it was updating the local state, and every time that re renders, well, it it's still got the text in there, so there, there, there's no difference in the model. Um, and then when I when I'm clicking that button, it is uh, adding the uh, it's concatenating what I've typed here onto the end of the uh, of the array, and then re-rendering the whole page, which is re-rendering uh, the list and putting the extra element in. So that's a little demonstration of React. You will play with it a little bit in the tutorial. We'll get you to get it working with the. Uh, with with the gibberish app so you so in this case I've just done stuff just up in the browser I haven't got it talking down to the server uh, in the tutorial you'll get it at least receiving data receiving those gibberish methods for, uh, messages from the server and rendering those into the page